episode of Budo no Kuni, The Land of Martial Arts. This video is brought to you by Martial Arts Video Production Company BAB Japan, its magazine Hidden, and its website budojapan.com. Hidden specializes in what are called Koryobuge, which is martial arts created before the Meiji uh, Restoration of 1868. In a sense, these arts are the predecessors of today's Kendo, Judo, or Aikido. Budojapan.com is a website with select English language content from Hiden as well as from BAB's extensive martial arts video collection. Below, you can find links for Hiden, BAB and Budo Japan. Please feel free to visit, contact us for any information, suggestions and share. Budo no Kuni is of course Japan and in these videos we aim to introduce you some of the non-Japanese who live or have lived in Japan for long periods of time and have studied, have studied extensively these classic arts, these choreo. My name is Grigoris Miliaresis, I write and occasionally take pictures for Hiden, and I also have been studying these arts for the last 11 years, first in Greece and then here in Japan. In this third episode of Buddha no Kuni, I'm happy to have with me Earl Hartman, a high-ranking American practitioner and teacher of Kyudo, and translator of the book Shots in the Dark, which is a Japanese re-examination of what is probably the best-known book on Kyudo, using Hergel's Zen in the Art of Archery. Er has lived in Japan for 11 years, and during that time he practiced, of course, Kyudo, but also Kendo, Nagao Ryu Taizutsu, Shinka Geryu Kenzutsu, and Musu Jiki Danesu Ryu Although he returned to the U.S. in 1985, he continues visiting Japan frequently and practicing with his Japanese teachers. Today he is a six dan Renshi from the Old Nippon Kyudo Federation and is teaching at the Seishinkan Kyudojo in Oakland, California. Uh, it's a, yes, oh. I, mean, I mean, I live in Palo Alto, but we, we rent a facility in Oakland. In Oakland, oh, this is how it is. So, in the Dojo's website, you can find some great resources on Kyudo, written and translated by Earl himself. And he's also practicing Shinto Musho Ryujo with Phil Rennick, also in the United States. Although his history with the martial arts goes back almost half a century, <laughs> Earl has been very quiet about it, at least online. Uh, his participation in internet forums has been scarce, and all his posts I've read were very well articulated, very cool-headed and to the point. Links to Earl's dojo and to the book he has translated can be also found right under this video. Check them for some great insights on Kyudo and Budo, uh, in Budo in general, and coming from someone who first came to Japan when things were different from how they are now. A little bit different. Yeah, a little bit different. So come to think of it, there were things very different from what they are now. You first came to Japan in 1972, right? Right, I was 20 years old. Um, I had started doing kendo when I was 17. Mm -hmm. um, where I'm from in California, um, I was born and brought up in Berkeley, mm -hmm. which is right across the bay from San Francisco. And there's always been a large Asian presence mm -hmm. in the Bay Area. And I had a lot of Japanese American friends in, in uh, elementary school. Mm -hmm. And when I was in high school, you know, basically, you know, The Seven Samurai and, and Yojimbo and Sanjudo and all those movies were very popular. So that was before the before the invasion of the Hong Kong. Uh, oh, long Kung before that. Long before right. that. Um, but uh, there was and there was a theater in San Francisco, Japantown, called the Kabuki Theater, and they would um, show all of these, uh, you know, martial arts movies, you know, ninja stuff, <coughs> like that. So my friends and I, we all wanted to be Someday. Toshiro Mifune yeah. specifically, um, and you know, the sort of doom. You know, with Nakadai Tatsuya mm -hmm. was like a hugely popular mm -hmm. film, and we all wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I saw a kendo demonstration when I was 17, and I thought it was like the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my life, and so I immediately started doing kendo. And there was some kendo available. Yeah, somewhere. yeah, there's, there, there, are, there are a number of dojos, yeah, kendo dojos, where I'm from. You know? Even back then? Even oh, yeah, yeah. Because today I'm pretty sure they are. Oh, they're all over the place. Um, okay. But they're with the Buddhist church in Oakland and the Buddhist church in San Francisco. Right, because you also had a big Buddhist community. Right, right. Uh, Most of the Japanese yeah. Americans in the area where I'm from are Jodo Shinshu mm -hmm. Buddhists, and they have a lot of big churches, and so the churches always have big gymnasiums mm -hmm. where all the Japanese American kids play baseball, basketball, <laughs> but uh, they also have, you know, um, kendo classes, so I started doing kendo there, and then... That was, you were 17, 17, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, almost exactly 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, 
One time, uh, a uh, high-ranking police instructor came to visit the dojos, mm -hmm. and I'd always, I had already been thinking about going to Japan, so I asked for his help mm -hmm. in trying to find a place to practice. And being an American, I figured, well, he'd give me some phone numbers, and, yeah. and I, you know, would you get call? You right, call. but he set up this whole thing for me, okay. you know. But he, so I started practicing with the riot squad police. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> you know. let, let's take things, you right, know, one no, at a time. So, uh, at first you started doing Kent, but also I remember reading somewhere that at some point you were also involved with the Society for Creative oh, and Art. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean... I, uh, ca can you say something about this group? Because well, not many people know yeah, about it. Yeah, the Society for Creative Anachronism is one of the first medieval-style recreationist groups that was started in Berkeley by a student of medieval studies at UC Berkeley named Diana Paxson. Oh, it started in Berkeley? Yeah, it started in Berkeley, okay. yeah. Um, Diana Paxson now is a very well-known uh, fantasy uh, author. Okay. She's written a lot of books and she's also, if you pay attention to this kind of thing, is, 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 is a, a witch, you know, of you know, the Dark Moon Coven or something like that. You know, very, you know, you know, crystals and, you know, things like that and all this stuff. But, um, so the Society of Creative Anachronism was originally, you know, founded, you know, just as a fun thing. And there were, you know, science fiction authors like Poole Anderson mm -hmm. was a member. Um, Jerry Purnell was a member. Harlan Ellison was a member. Um, so all these people who are interested in medieval things and science fiction and fandom <coughs> and everything like that, you know, started that, and since, you know, I was obsessed with the Middle Ages and knights and armor and things, I got involved in that. So it wasn't just with the, with the Japanese no, knights, you had a thing for knights. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. I had a thing for knights. So, you know, um, so I got into that first, and then I got into Kendo, and then when I was 20, I wanted to go to Japan, um, and so I did, and mm -hmm. wound up practicing with the riots. This is how you came to Japan. First, you, did, you didn't come to Tokyo first, right? No, you no. Um, what's really funny is that um, I'd heard that Tokyo was this really big urban city and I didn't want to go to such a place. I wanted to go to the traditional Japan. Yeah, the real Japan. The real Japan. And so I asked somebody in my kendo class where a nice traditional town was and he said, well, I've heard that Kanazawa is a nice town. And I, that's how I decided. Okay. He'd never even been there. <laughs> but he said, I've heard it's a nice traditional town. So I said, okay, I'm going to Kanazawa. And so I went there and it completely changed my life. So. And uh, this is uh, for, for, the, for the people in Kanazawa was where your, your teacher gave you the, the recommendations. Or the, right. So the he, I mean, he's... You, he you was, told him you were going to Kanazawa. Yes, he was one of the, he was one of the, if not the highest ranking instructors in the Keishicho. Mm -hmm. Uh, his name was Kikuchi, or people called him Gen Sensei, I think. Okay. Um, and he was frighteningly good. Mm -hmm. I mean, just like unbelievably good. So he, you know, I guess he just called the Kidotai up and said, hey, this foreigner is going to come and practice you. And so before I knew it, I was getting beaten, <laughs> just beaten for three hours a day. Um, with the riot squad police. Yeah, I would guess that. I mean, well, the, the level of skill, the skill difference was like just so tremendous. I mean, the weakest guy in the squad was a sandan, and I didn't have any rank at all. And the top guy was a rokudan. And it's just but even I mean, for regular kendoka practicing with the with oh no the no, ladies, no forget about it, forget yeah. about it. They would just mop the floor with them. I mean, yeah. These guys, they practice kendo for six hours a day, mm -hmm. three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon for six months every year. And then, then six month, the rest of the, the time, at the other six months of the year, they would do regular police work and only practice like five times a week, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and their job was to go out to the regional and national tournaments and win. Yeah. And if they didn't win, they were kicked off the squad. So these were the strongest kendo people that Kanazawa had. And when they went out and, and practiced with the people from, from Yokohama, mm -hmm. which is where Gen Sensei was from, or from Tokyo or from Osaka, they never won anything. Because the people in Osaka practiced six hours a day, 12 months a year. <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, these guys, I mean, I'd never, I, I, I 
couldn't believe that it was possible for anybody to get that strong. And, uh, what was exactly your kendo background when you came here? How much kendo you had I done? had been doing kendo for three years, and I was practicing twice a week. And twice I a week. You know, <laughs> you know, I mean, and you know, I, I, it was ridiculous. Yeah. So like, have you ever been, have you ever dived into a really deep pool, you know, 15 feet down, you go yeah. over to the bottom, and then you kind of look up, and you see the surface of the water up there, and you're trying to get back to the surface. Well, that's sort of how I felt. I mean, I was, I was completely out of my league. I should have gone to, like, some, you know, high school. Yeah, and practice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with twice yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, Ease yourself in, sort of. I just, I don't know what I was thinking. I mean, I had no idea what was. Yeah, but you didn't know, right? You no, just I had no idea. Because this were the so, so I practiced for a year and a half, and and I, that's when I started doing um, EI. Okay. I also started doing kudo. At that yeah, time. I was going to ask about kudo because kudo is your main thing, and right. it's not exactly you know, similar to kendo. I mean, well, in in a way, I've always loved bows and arrows ever since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, just you know, shooting bows and arrows was. But you hadn't done any Western archery, no, had you? No, you know, just messed around as a hobby. I never had any instruction. But, you know, I read Zen and the Art of Archery, and, you know, all about this magician who could, like, hit the target in the dark without even aiming, and you didn't even need any technique to do it. Yeah. All you had to do was, you know, get enlightened. And I thought, well, who <laughs> yeah. wouldn't want to learn how to do that? I mean, it's like magic, right? Mm -hmm. So I got to Hanazawa, and, you know, I settled into the kendo routine, and then I, you know, went to the local kudo teacher, so my routine was I would get up, go to the dojo, get beaten up for three hours, take a bath, have lunch, go to the kudo in the afternoons, then teach just enough English so I wouldn't starve to death. Yeah, but I was going to ask how you might do yeah, it. Yeah, I, I taught, you I taught English, like, right? I taught English like nobody does that. Yeah, right. 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 You know, I taught just enough English not to, to feed myself and to pay my rent. And mm -hmm. then the rest of the time I was doing, you know, kendo and kudo and then EI twice, twice a week mm -hmm. in the evenings. And so I did that for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. and that was the, the first period that you was did the first Japan, period, right? right. Yeah. And uh, then you returned. I went back. I went back to the states for two years, and married the woman to whom I'm still married, um, who's from Kanazawa. We we met in a, in a kendo match. I'm, She's also a kendo. Yeah, I'm, I'm standing there, and like so, they said, you know, you you know, hey Ikigami, go out and fight that guy. And so this little Japanese woman, you know, goes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we met. Okay. You know, um, and things haven't changed. <laughs> um, and so she also did EI as well, so we were in the same class. And so, you know, we were Budo friends for, you know, like more than a year. And then, you know, one thing led to another and we got married and we went back to the States. Well, we, we went back to the States and got married and then we had two kids. And then um, I, you know, wanted to go back to Japan. Mm -hmm. So we went back to Kanazawa. Um, I taught English at a local private high school while I did Kudo primarily. Mm -hmm. Because by, by now your focus had moved more Yeah, to well the thing is, um, my EI teacher <coughs> died like less than a year after I started practicing with him. Mm -hmm. He died in the middle of a kendo practice, just had a heart attack. Yeah, I remember this story. Died. Yeah. Yeah. This is how most Budoka would like to die. Well, everyone said, yeah, you know, what a great, what a great way to go. And mm -hmm. I'd say, well, no, actually, he... I still need him. <laughs> and then, um, you know, there was a new teacher and he changed some things and I kind of lost heart because, you know, mm -hmm. the transition was difficult because the way he did the techniques was not quite the same. What was the name of your teacher? Masaoka Kazumi. And he was a student of uh, Oemasamichi, right? Um, he was, as I believe, the last recipient of a Kongen no Maki from Oemasamichi. Um, so he was from Kochi um, and started doing um, EI when he was like 16 or something mm -hmm. like that. And then later he went to the Budo Senmon Gakko in mm -hmm. Kyoto, graduated from there, and then was posted to Kanazawa, where, as I understand it, he developed some kind of a relationship with Nakayama Hakudo, mm -hmm. who was from Ishikawa Ken. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so then after the war, he went back to Kanazawa, and he was there when I got there. He was like, 71, 72. I think he was 73 when he died. Mm -hmm. But he smoked and drank quite a lot. Yeah. He was a little, little guy. 
And uh, he was one of these people, you were telling me that he was one of these people involved in the creation of the Seite. As, I, as I understand it, he was instrumental in the creation of the Seite EI, but I haven't really looked into that in any mm -hmm. depth. That's what I've read. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I read that he really didn't want to do it because it wasn't really I, but he, they finally prevailed upon him to, to, to make the Seite. And I remember when the Seite was, were first put together, we had to practice them. And we're all going, this is like, this isn't Asian Dew. Why do we have to do this? Stuff? Because uh, basically with him you were doing Asian Dew, It was right? just Asian Dew, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I learned the first two sets, the, you know, Seizanabu and the Tadehi. And uh, now, uh, speaking about old schools, you also practiced uh, Nagao Ryu and Shingage Ryu, right? Right. Well, so what so, happened yeah. is the second... The, the because second, this is the main focus Right. Of so what uh, happened was, right? you know, I went, so, I went back to Kanazawa mm -hmm. and um, I continued doing uh, Kyudo and I, I got promoted to Yondan mm -hmm. Kyudo at that time. And I had a, a, a Kyudo friend who was a student at the Kanazawa Kogyo Daigaku. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, hey Hartman, you know, you like martial arts, there's this guy who there's the club at the, at the school and they do Nagao Ryu Taijutsu. Mm -hmm. I said, well, that sounds interesting. So I went out You there. didn't know anything about it. You never even heard of it. Yeah, most Korean people yeah. don't. It's um, not a very well-known school. And um, so I went out there and uh, was introduced to him and decided to start practicing. So I practiced with him for like twice a week um, for almost two years. Mm -hmm. And I learned the first 24 techniques. And can you tell us anything about this school? Uh, I mean, well, as I understand it, it was... It, well, it, it... To an uninitiated person, it would probably look sort of, kind of like some kind of Aikido mm -hmm. or Jiu-Jitsu. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's not. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first sets that I learned were primarily um, an armed man against an unarmed man. And by um, armed do you mean? Armed um, with? with a sword or a kodachi. Okay. Um, and uh, the question is, well, how do you protect yourself mm. against such a situation? So it's kind of like a, a Budo friend of mine described Nagari as like, you know, um, Arakiryu's punk kid brother. <laughs> okay. You know, because it's very Arakiryu-ish because the very first technique you learn is how to protect yourself when you're attacked in the middle of bowing to someone. Okay. Like yeah, this you're sitting, on, you're sitting on the floor and you're bowing and then he tries to attack you, well, what do you do? Mm. Then, you know, how to protect yourself from a guy who's got a kodachi and then for, with a sword, whether the sword's out or you, whether he's drawing mm -hmm. it. So there are a number of techniques and it all depends on basically closing the distance very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, poking his eye out, and then throwing him down and breaking his arm, mm -hmm. basically. <laughs> um, but um, um, it's to re be really good in Nagaru, you have to know where the Kyusho are. Mm -hmm. And Shimeno Sensei, who was my teacher, was very small, originally a judo man. But he realized that he, since he was so small, that he'd never really be able to do that well in judo because of the rules. Mm -hmm. So he started you know, doing Nagaru with Maida Kogetsu. Um, but according to Shimeno Sensei, at any rate, Maeda was guilty of either not really knowing the techniques or misrepresenting them or not teaching them properly. And so um, Shimeno Sensei broke away and founded his own group called Sei Den Nangaoryu. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the properly, the tra the properly uh, transmitted. Um, I, I, met, uh, I met Kogetsu a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first time, actually, this, this is such a great story, <laughs> and I think people will appreciate yeah, sure. it. So, my Yai teacher died in the middle of the kendo practice, and I was what's called the, the um, dosoku gakari at the funeral. I was in charge of taking everybody's outside shoes, um, putting, them, putting them in the box and giving them slippers so they could go into the dojo where the funeral was being held. And so I'm there with all these shoes in my arms, and you know, trying to put them away, and I hear this, you know, clop, 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 clop. Which was so, not shoes. <laughs> you know, which was not shoes. And I'm aware 
of someone kind of looming over me because I'm bent over like this, putting the shoes away. And so I turn and I look up and there's my Nicole gets them. The thing is, everybody else had come in in the proper black suit and white shirt and black tie. And he was done up like somebody from a Sengoku Jidai, you know, um, Chambara movie. He had these, you know, hakama, a big jimbaori, mm -hmm. you know, um, a huge long sword in a bright orange saya. <laughs> and he, his hair, he, he looked a lot, he looked a lot like uh, Yamaguchi Gogen, the from Goju Yuga, you know, yeah. the, the hair was all, he had really long hair and it was all just like all over his shoulders. And the clock clock was dead, probably, and right? Geta, right, right. And so I look up at him, and he just like looks down at me like, like, what's this? You know, <laughs> what? And like, we're just looking at each other. He doesn't say anything, and then without a word, he just like takes his sword out of his, you know, obi and just like shoves it out, you know. <laughs> and then he just like walks in, you know. What that's supposed to do with it? Yeah, like, what am I, what? <laughs> but he was quite a character, and actually, um, later on, when I, when I met, Yagyu Nobuharu Sensei. Um, and yeah, so I was going to right. ask about no, but the, the reason I want to bring this up now is because, so I started, I was practicing with the Yagyu Kai in Tokyo, and so um, Yagyu Sensei would come up from Nagoya like once a month mm -hmm. or something like that. And so he said, you know, do you practice any other martial arts? And I told him, Joe, and then I said, I practice Nagao also. And everybody just like laughed like, <laughs> like, like it was the, the most hilarious thing they'd ever heard. And so basically Yagi says, you don't practice with that clown Maida, do you? You know, because like everybody thought he was, a, apparently, everybody thought he was a gigantic idiot. Um, and I said, no, 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 I practiced with this, you know. But since you mentioned, it, and, uh, you practiced with uh, Nagaori Ubibu for a couple of years? About two years, mm -hmm. yeah, a little less than two years. And, and you also practiced uh, Shinkagaryu, right? That and came later. That oh, came that actually came much later. later. I mean, when I say I practiced Shinkagaryu, I mean, like, you know, just yeah. a tiny <laughs> bit. Um, um, oh, but I need to tell you, though, that uh, Shimeno sensei, he really knew. Oh, you're Nagaryu? Yeah, he you? really knew. Uh, yeah, you were talking about Tsubo, you know, right? He really knew where the Tsubo were, man. And if he got his hand on you, man, forget about it. He just went down. Just by grabbing oh, you. Yeah, he, he, just hurt, right? he just hurt so much. Okay. You know, it was just such incredible pain. Do you still remember that? Well, there's one. There was one spot, like right here, the, between the two muscles. Uh -huh. If you choose, if you pinch the right spot. Yeah, it starts to feel right. So what happened? You see how your shoulder went up? Yeah. Well, what, so there's a technique. He tries to grab you, and you and and you you get in there. This happens, yeah. And that happens, and then he just throws you yeah. down. No, it's. I mean, it it you know, you know when he grabs you, it's just like. Ow. Yeah, it's very natural. To you know, this. exactly. Really so once, yeah. the, once the shoulder comes up, all he has to do is just push you, and you just. And this is your position. <laughs> yeah, that's the position, right? There's no. It's not like Aikido where you kind of, you know, Find guide him around, yeah. and then he kind of loses balance, and then you take him back that way. No, he just grabs the spot. Yeah, and it hurts, and then pow. Yeah. And, and then you do your. Then you do bang. Yeah. You know, the grass. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. right. You know, crush the larynx basically. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of the techniques. Um, because the, 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 the Kyusho attack is not obvious to people who are watching, mm -hmm. it looks like he's being unbalanced in an Aikido sort of a way. Yeah, but in a bad Aikido sort of a way. Yeah, but it doesn't, it's not like that at mm -hmm. all. Um, so, and there's another technique where you're lying on your back and he attacks a nerve right here and, and it just, you know, you can't move. Mm -hmm. Well, he just, just, you know, puts this little, puts his thumb on there and then you just... So basically, an important skill in this. Uh, uh, you, you need, need to, to have. To, you, you really need, need to grip, have. Right? Yes, you really need to have grip. a strong grip, and you need to know where to grip. Did, did, did you or did they do any special practice for the grip? Well, he would do push-ups like this. Okay. <laughs> not not like this, but like, like this, this. Yes. Which I can't do. Mm -hmm. um, he, and I, the, since this is all about great Budo stories, there's another story. He had been learning all of these Kyusho Tsubo mm -hmm. things, and so he was apparently on a train trip with one of his judo senpai, who apparently was not a very nice person. Mm -hmm. So he said, hey, Shimeno, massage my legs. So as he's massaging <laughs> the guy's legs, he's attacking the Tsubo, and by the time the train reached the station, the guy tried to stand up, and he just, <laughs> he he just <laughs> fell down because his legs were paralyzed. You know. And so I think Shimeno Sensei was the real deal. Um, he was a 
he was a very nice person, but he really, really knew. And the, 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 the thing about the thing about Nang Ao Yu is because he's got a sword and you don't. The main thing is is that there's no fancy stuff. If you don't close the distance before he can cut you, yeah, he'll cut, he'll cut, cut you, and that'll be the end of it. And that'll be the end of it. Right. So, so he said the main thing about Nang Ao is 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 sensing when the attack is going to come, and then just jumping in on the guy. Mm -hmm. And doing something very practical, very, very, very fast, practical really. and very straightforward. Mm -hmm. Like most of most of the things, it starts with the mitsubushi. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you poke his eye out first. So and you have both pain and yeah, and it's kind of yeah. like that. And then also, also this is interesting. In Nagaoryu, when we tied the obi, mm -hmm. the knot never went in the back. Okay. Went in the front because if you have a big knot on your obi, when you, when down, you go down on your back, it's right. gonna hurt you. Right. So that's one of the things they would do, right? So we always tied the OB in the front. Yeah. So Again, it means that this is a school that only right. really cares about. Right. You know, I mean, the, 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 the whole thing is the whole thing about Nangaudi was finishing it as quickly as possible mm -hmm. and not wasting any time because if you waste any time, he's going to kill you. And they never attack the wrist, by the way. None of this Aikido oh, wrist oh, stuff. Yeah, yeah. They always attack the fingers. Yes, because uh, well, no. But if you've got a sword in your hand, yeah, and you grab the hand like this, you can't let it go, and you can't do all this weird twisting, right? right? And then if you try to let it go, you just, you just. <laughs> okay. And, and, and what, what he did now was press my finger down. So. Yeah, no, you just because if you just press the finger in the right way again, it 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 damages the ligaments so much. It mm -hmm. hurts so much. No, it totally hurts. <laughs> it hurts so much. Yeah, but because if you grab the wrist. Yeah, you, you can have all that here. Yeah, you can't. You, with Nangaudi, you never, never do that. You always attack the weapon hand. The, the main focus in Nangaudi is neutralizing the weapon hand before anything else. Yeah. So it's always uh, against the weapon. No, so I mean, it's, it's always against the weapon. I mean, the techniques that I learned, it's always against the weapon. These are the 24 first basic techniques. It's always against the weapon. And that was, uh, to, to get back on track, uh, that was still in Kanazawa, oh, the second time you were in Kanazawa. From 1972 to 1970, no, I'm sorry, from 1974 to 1976. Oh. And then I sat down and took stock of my life and realized the only saleable skill I had was a fairly decent ability to speak Japanese, but I couldn't read or write. Mm -hmm. So I've got two kids and I've got to think about, well, what am I going to do from now on? So we came to Tokyo, I went to Jochi University and went through their whole Japanese language program and learned how to read and write and then started working as a translator. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that time, during your Tokyo time, you, were, you weren't practicing Nagao anymore? Right? No, no, there's nobody to practice with. It's a totally local thing in Kaga. In Kaga. I don't think there's anybody outside of Kanazawa that practices it But at all. you would practice Kyudo? Yeah, course. I kept practicing Kyudo. I pra so I practiced Kyudo with a, uh, a teacher named Murakami Hisashi. Who was a very very high ranking uh, teacher, and then I uh, practiced with him for eight years, and then I had to go back to the states. To the states, and uh, that's well, that was in 1985, and I've been back there ever since. And uh, Shinkai So what happened is I got back to America. I'm still doing kudo. I looked up some EI people who said they did musoji kiden Asian do the way my teacher did it, but it wasn't true at all. Mm -hmm. They, everything they did was different, so I didn't bother to continue practicing with them. And then um, I'm not exactly sure how I heard about Joe, but in the late 80s or early 90s, I heard about Joe. Joe? Joe, Joe. Ah, Joe, Joe, Joe. Yeah, Joe. yeah and said, so, well, that sounds really interesting. So I started doing that. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing it ever since. Uh, this, it's, it's really, really funny. I don't remember the exact year that I started. I, I can't remember. I mean, it was the late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I thought it was a recent thing, Joe. No, I didn't know I mean, it was no, I've been doing Joe for quite a while now. The only problem is, is that if, if I had been living in Seattle with Relnik Sensei and mm -hmm. going to practice regularly, I'd probably be, I'd like to think, <laughs> anyway, that I'd be fairly high up in the curriculum by now. Mm -hmm. But I'm not because, you know, I, you know, down in, San, in the San Francisco area and there was, you know, you have to learn new techniques from Relic Sensei. He doesn't allow anybody else to teach new techniques. Mm -hmm. Although he has a couple, he has a few Menkyo Kaiden now who can. Yeah, but at the time, at the time there weren't any. There weren't any. So um, for the amount of time I've been doing Joe, my, 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 
uh, repertoire of techniques is rather limited. And you always did Koryujo, right? You, I've never you always did Shinobu Shoryu, you never did the same thing. I've sense. never done Seite, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the beginning, Relic Sensei would teach Seite in a kind of a Kodu sort of a way. Mm -hmm. But he, I'm not even sure if he does that anymore. I don't remember any of the Seite Kanta. Oh, okay. Although I learned a few of them in the beginning. And uh, the Shinkagiryu? The Shinkagiryu, so um, for a period of about five years, from like the early 90s to the late 90s, I was going back and forth on business quite frequently. And you mean between the US and Japan? And Japan. US and Japan, and one of my old Kudo students was learning Shik Shinkagiryu in Nagoya with, with Yagi Sensei. With, with Yagi -sensei. And so he said, well, you know, the Yagyukai has a group in, uh, in Tokyo, mm -hmm. so I started going there when I came to, uh, to Japan on business. I would practice with them. Mm -hmm. So I learned the um, Sangaku en Notachi, the Toriyage Zakai, mm -hmm. which is the very first basic set mm -hmm. you learn, and then the Haseho. And that's it. That's all I know about Shinkagaryu. So, I mean, when I said I practice Shinkagaryu, what I mean is I... I was lucky enough to be able to practice a bit with Yagi Sensei, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think he was a very great man. Mm -hmm. Just the way he taught was mm -hmm. so different. Uh, we should explain that you mean the, the previous Yagi Sensei. I'm sorry, the previous Yagi Sensei. I knew the present Yagi Sensei who also practiced at the Tokyo group at that time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Yagi Sensei had no children, and the present Yagi Sensei was his nephew. Mm -hmm. So he adopted him. His original name was Ishida. Mm -hmm. and they, so Yagi Sensei adopted him, and he changed his name to Yagi, and he's the present Yagi Sensei now. Okay. So uh, now you're practicing Kyudo, and you're still practicing Joe. I'm right? still practicing Joe. Yeah, I am. You know, Joe of Northern California. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's only me and one other guy. I mean, we had a fairly large group for a while, but everybody left, mm -hmm. um, um, and so it's just me and one other fellow. And was it, what was it that drew you to Joe? Again, it's what drew me to all of the things that I did. I just thought it was really, really cool. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I, I'm not, may, you know, maybe back when I was younger, I would have said, well, you know, for spiritual training purposes and you know, to, you know, become a better person or, you know, to, you know, do mushashu gyo and to learn the secrets of the blah, blah. blah. I, I probably would have said something like that. Yeah. But... And I think that I think that's a perfectly good motivation, but I'm, I don't know. It's it's very hard to explain why something attracts you. Yeah, There's something tremendously dynamic about Joe. Mm -hmm. um, just the different ways that you can use the weapon, mm -hmm. and the techniques looked really, really clean. Um, how should I put this? I remember watching a video of some Korean sword stuff. Mm -hmm. And these guys, they were jumping around and yelling and screaming and making these huge slashing cuts. But it was so clearly and obviously imp impractical. No one would fight it like was that. It, 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 was, it, was like, uh, like it was screen fighting. It was, right? it was screen fighting, yeah. yeah. Um, and I looked at that, and maybe it's because I already had a background in Kodyu by that time. I just thought, I just thought it looked incredibly silly. <laughs> and the, the thing is, the thing is, is that um, how should I put this? If that's a real sword, mm -hmm. you're not going to have time to do anything fancy. You have to stop him before he kills you. We're going back to go to the Nagaori. Yeah, you right? have to stop him before he kills Something. you. Fast so and fast and, and straight to the point, mm -hmm. no fancy nothing. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of the techniques in Joe, it's just like straight in, that's you know, and that's it. Um, and that appeals to me, the directness of it appeals to me. But the way the body is used and, and, and the way the Joe is used, it, 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 looked, it looked impressive without being flamboyant. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with Shinkage Ryu. The Shinkage Ryu techniques, you know, it's all cut to the center. Yeah. There's nothing fancy, you know, you know, you you stay behind the sword and you cut to the center. And like when I was doing kendo, mm -hmm. um, if you have a good men attack, 
a, just a straight in men attack. If you can, if you can set the guy up correctly and simply go in straight, you'll win. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so there's no need for all this flashy stuff. Mm -hmm. So it just seems to me that real budo, real buge, it can't be flashy. Mm -hmm. If it's flashy, it's fake. And so, although Joe is very, um, uh, I'm not sure what well, I'm not sure what the word, proper word I, I need here. Um, but it, the techniques look, um, kind of involved, but they're not. It, it's hard to explain. But I mean, it's the body mechanics and the, the body positioning and how to take advantage of the opening and how to create the opening. Anyway, it's just like. It's it's like you, you when you like I don't know why do people like Van Gogh as opposed to yeah, Rubens? Right. I mean no, <laughs> yeah. I really don't know. I mean it just it just something about the straightforwardness and, and the dynamism of it really appealed to me a lot, and so that's why I started doing it. Yeah, now that you mentioned it, I'm thinking that this is probably what is also appealing with Kudo, right? I mean it's you have a boy, you have an arrow, you have a target, and you know you right. You see the thing. Your and, and, well, actually, you know, I, I took my Kyoshi test uh, uh, yesterday, and it was just an absolute disaster. I mean, I guess <laughs> I mean I shot so badly. It's just humiliating how badly I shot, and it's not just because I missed. Mm -hmm. The shot was bad. Even if I hit the target with both shots, I wouldn't it have would passed. Me. Um, and that's the thing about Kudo. Um, it's it's deceptively simple. Mm -hmm. But the th the thing is, like when you when you're when you're with another person, uh, an actual opponent, mm -hmm. what you do depends on what he does, yes. right? And very, I, I found sometimes, like in the middle of a kendo match that you get going in a rhythm and then you just see something and then like it's there, right? Mm -hmm. And you get the point. So <clears throat> the very fact that the situation moves so fast and you have to adjust to the situation creates its own energy and own dynamic. And if you can tap into that energy, you can manage the dynamic. Mm -hmm. but, but it's because there's another person. Mm -hmm. With Kudo, the only thing is the target right. and you. So whatever you do in relation to the target is a, is, is a phantom of your own imagination. So if you can't shoot properly, well, whose fault is that? It's, it, it's yours. You can't say, well, the other guy was better than I was. Mm -hmm. Actually, I remember this, this, this made a great impression on me. There was a Japanese judo guy in the Olympics, and he was like, you know, Japan's hope or something. And he got, you know, far from the competition. I think he lost in the finals to somebody. So... You know, he, they, they interviewed him afterwards and said, well, you know, why did you lose? And he said, well, the other guy was just better than me. <laughs> no, but, but I think that's brilliant. Yeah, the other guy was stronger than I was. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. You know. Um, and that dynamic doesn't apply in Kudo, because all you're doing is shooting the bow yourself. Right. So if you can't control your own mind mm -hmm. and stabilize yourself within yourself, it's really, really obvious when you can't do it. Mm -hmm. And so then, like for example, like, why do you shoot well at practice, but when you go to a test, you don't? Or you shoot well at practice, but you, because I shoot pretty well at practice when I'm by myself and I'm just, you know, no pressure. But then I go to a test and my teachers are watching and I just fall to pieces. Well, why is that? That I'm doing the same thing. Right. It's only so because, something, something it's only because, here, right? right, it's only because I think that that the test is more important than the other stuff, mm -hmm. that there's more on the line, that there's more writing on it, that I, you know, create this image in my mind of how important it is, and so and then... this translates the tension? Right? Exactly, yeah. so the question is, how do you deal with that self-induced tension? Because you're doing the same thing that you do at practice. There's mm -hmm. no reason it should be any different. Right. But it's all because of what you conceive it to be. Mm -hmm. And so that... That dynamic is there with every single shot, mm -hmm. and every single shot gives the, you the opportunity to see whether you can be calm in the face of this adversity that you've created in your mind. Mm -hmm. And that's why the tests, that's why I go to tests, mm -hmm. even, even though I'm the last few times <laughs> pretty bad, that's the reason I do it, because that's what teaches you who you really are. 
I remember I, the last test in Kyoto, I finished and I went out and one of, my, one of the teachers was there and he said, how did you do? And I said, I failed. And he said, you know, I talk to a lot of people and they say, you know, after they failed, well, I couldn't, I couldn't make my best shot. I wasn't able to put forth all of my ability. Mm -hmm. And he said, none of that's true. That's an excuse. Mm -hmm. He said, the shot that you make at the test is your real shot. So that's why I go to the test, even though... Because this is when you have the pressure and this is when you have the actual trial, right? Right, right. and I've been successful. I mean, I have a wrenchy rokadon, so I've been able to... Do it. Do it, you know... Uh, <laughs> well, a few well, times. Well, a few times, but the fact that I can't do it consistently is vexing, but that's the whole right. training of Kudo, that's the whole point of it. Right. Right? You know. Yeah, um, I said in the introduction that uh, most people, including myself, know you from the translation of uh, Professor Yamada's essay, The Myth of Zen and the Art of Archery, right. and uh, the book that he wrote later, The Shots in the Dark, which right. you also translated. Right. You translated both, right? Right. The, he originally um, wrote the paper. Um, the actual literal translation of the title of his paper was Zen in the Art of Archery as Myth. Right. But but that sounded clumsy in English, so mm -hmm. we just decided to call it the myth of Zen in the Art of Archery. And, and he later developed that into the book Shots mm -hmm. in the Dark. And you translated both the essay yeah. and the, yeah. the book, right? Yeah. And uh, I want I want to say sorry uh, that um, you know I haven't done Kudo. I have but I have translated uh, a book about Kudo from English to Greek. It's the oh. the book by the the Prospero. Oh, that's a, yeah. that's an excellent. Book. Yeah, I thought so too. That's why I chose to translate it. And you know, from from the little I understand about Kudo and from what I understand about Budo, you know, Hegel's book never made any sense. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot to say that uh, uh, Yamada, uh, Professor Yamada's work is about uh, a book written by a German philosopher called Eugen Hegel, and his book was uh, Zen and the Art of Archery, he yeah. wrote back in the, what was it, 30s. 30s. And you know, I read this book because it has been translated you know, in all languages all over the world, and, but it never made sense to me, even from a non q right. <laughs> point. So when I read his essay and then the book, and this is a book written by someone who has done Kendo and translated by someone who right. is doing Kendo, a it, Kudo, uh, sorry, it made sense. Right. right? Well, and I wanted to ask you about this, uh, right. how you got involved well, in that? Well, first of all, like I, like I told you, I, I, um, I've always... Um, liked bows and arrows, you know. Growing up, you know, Robin Hood was my hero. I didn't want to just pretend I was Robin Hood. I wanted to be, be Robin, Hood. Robin Hood, you know. Just something about bows and arrows. I don't know why, you know. It's hard to say why people like the things that they like, right. but I just always liked archery. So, um, I... I do you remember eBudo, the website? Yeah, e -Budo? Budo. Well, I was, you know, posting on that a lot, and, and there was a guy a professor, I think, at UCLA named William Bodyford, mm -hmm. who is a member of the, of the uh, Kashima Shindu. Mm -hmm. And we were talking back and forth. And then um, he must have known Yamada-sensei in s some way or another, because he, he asked me if I wanted to translate this essay. Mm -hmm. And um, so I translated, that's how I got to know Yamada-sensei. And then he later developed it into a book. Mm -hmm. And so, essentially, Eugen Herigl, the, the German philosopher who came to Japan in the late 20s, mm -hmm. early, I think it was in, in the late 20s or the mid 20s, um, he went to um, the, uh, the Teikoku Dai Nakunandakin um, in Sendai, mm -hmm. um, you know, the Imperial University in Sendai. And his teacher, Alakenzo, was teaching Kudo there. Now, the thing about Alakenzo is that he was a very famous archer. He was a very, very skillful archer. But he was sort of a sui generis person. Well, right? well he originally just did um, Hekiryu Sekkaha okay. Kyujutsu, mm -hmm. and he got Menkyo Kaiden like in two years. Um, so he was something of a prodigy. Um, and um, he later um, took instruction from Honda Toshizane, mm -hmm. who was kind of the 
savior of Kudo for the modern world, actually. Um, he was one of the people who originally started synthesizing things to create a, a modern Kudo. A modern Kudo, yeah. And um, so, you know, in his early days, Awakenza was no different from pretty much anybody else, but somewhere along the line, he apparently had sort of some profound mystical experience mm -hmm. which caused him to reevaluate the purpose of Kudo. Mm -hmm. And this is occurring at the same time that, that Kano Jigoro was synthesizing Judo from Jujutsu. Right. You know, this is in the Taisho period where basically people were, where traditional culture was in danger of just being completely washed away. And so people were trying to reformulate it for the modern age. And so, like, what's the purpose of these things? Yeah, it's the period of the, of the birth of most Gendai Buddha. Right, right, exactly. And so, well, the question is, well, what is Kudo for? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, originally, Kyujutsu was like for what any other Buddha was, is to yeah. learn skill to use the weapon. Yeah. Kill, right. kill other people. Right. right. Um, and since that was no longer an operative concept, well, what's Kyudo for? So it was the beginning of using it as a, as a form of, you know, Seishin Tanden, you know, Ningen Kese, you know, forming, you know, the person, right? And the, the other thing is that people were, this is when the Butoku guy was trying to develop a national standard for all right. kinds of Buddha. Right essentially as a way to militarize the, the population because they're trying to, you know, in America we look at, you know, the martial arts as being the prime example of Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you look at, look at it historically, the kind of martial arts, especially anything involving weapons like swords, mm -hmm. you know, the bushi class was, you know, maybe one-tenth of the population, right. if that. So you've got this, you know, thin crust of bushi mm -hmm. on the top, mm -hmm. and then you've got, you know, the, the commoners and the artisans and the shopkeepers and the farmers mm -hmm. who know nothing about any of this stuff. And now, to mobilize the country, you have to have some way of inculcating the, you know, mm -hmm. the military spirit, so you synthesize these arts mm -hmm. for the general population. And Awa was one of the people who was involved in that, so you have to say, well, what is the purpose of all of this? And and this is the person that Hergel met. Right. Made. So Hergel is, uh, met Awa after he'd reformulated his ideas mm -hmm. and was considered, apparently, kind of like a lunatic by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. The thing is, he was an expert archer, mm -hmm. Awa was. Yeah, no, no one debates that. Nobody debates that. I mean, he, he um, with, the first time he went to the Kyoto tournament, he took second place and the second time he won, and then that's it, he stopped competing. Okay. Because he had already proven that he was better than everybody. Um, and so, he, um, he stated that, you know, the, the purpose of Kudo is to unite with the universe. Mm -hmm. Which is like, nobody had ever said anything like that before. Okay. Um, and a, a contemporary of his, my teacher's teacher, mm -hmm said that the purpose of Kudo was by following the proper shooting method to strike the target. That was his purpose of Kudo. Okay. There's, there's a gap between yeah, these two things. It's just unbridgeable, really. So, so anyway, what I think... So, you know, Yamada-sensei researched this pretty thoroughly mm -hmm. and found that, um, that uh, Herigl had already been interested in Zen while he lived in Germany. Right and that one of his purposes in going to Japan was to learn Zen, mm -hmm. and that he wanted to learn Kudo because he was under the impression that it was a way to learn Zen, mm -hmm. right? Because, as I understand, I haven't researched this deeply, but according to Professor Yamada, there was a, um, a uh, trend or like a fashion mm -hmm. in Taisho Japan to start explaining everything in, in terms of Zen. Mm -hmm. and, and Suzuki Daisets it was certainly at the bottom of all of this. Because his whole thesis was that everything in Japan was Zen. Right. Right. So with that, with, with that kind of pre, um, preconceived notion, there was no way that Herigl could not have come to the conclusion that Kudo was Zen. Mm -hmm. Because Awa apparently used a lot of very cryptic and abstruse kind of language in describing Kudo. And, and this is what Herigl perceived as Zen. Right, exactly. And so the other thing is, is that my personal view is that Herigl simply didn't have the cultural um, not understanding. understanding. He didn't have the frame of reference mm -hmm. right. to understand what, what Al was talking about. 
And he didn't, he didn't speak any Japanese, right? His Japanese appeared, through, right. He, he spoke through an interpreter yeah. who admitted later that some of, her, some of Awa's lectures were so abstruse that he couldn't understand them at all. Yeah. Um, and the famous, the famous shot in the dark episode where um, Awa hits the target with one, arrow. with one arrow and then splits his arrow with the second one. Um, the interpreter wasn't there. Right. So, so, um, whatever happened, whatever whatever happened he Herigl, explained to Herigl? Right, but Herigl didn't have the language to understand it. And later on, you know, um, Awa said to, uh, yeah, to, uh, to other people, yeah, right, to Anzawa sensei, who was one of his main <coughs> disciples, that it was just a coincidence. But Herigl took this as proof that an enlightened archer can hit his own arrow in the dark, mm. right? Mm -hmm. um, um, so the thing about the thing about the thing about Herigl that's a problem is that he's almost right about things, but if he were com if he were completely off the mark, mm -hmm. you could ignore him. Yeah. But but the thing is, a lot of the things that he has his teacher telling him, my teachers have said to me as, as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but they just don't mean what Herigl thought they meant. That's all. That's the problem. The thing is that uh, his book is still very popular. Well, no, the thing is that this, and again, you know, um, um, Yamada Sensei addresses that in, this in his book, is that the Westerners need Japan to be a mystical, strange place. Yeah. If Japan is just a place like any other place, well, then what's interesting about it? Right. No, it has to be this fount of oriental mystical wisdom. Because, like, like, then why do kudo and not just regular archery? Why right. is kudo so special? Right. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, the other reason I do kudo is because I like old things. Right. The bow is handmade by a skilled craftsman from bamboo and wood. So the, the, glove, the glove is made by a skilled craftsman, the arrows are made by skilled craftsmen from natural materials, and this appeals to my sensibilities. I don't want plastic and aluminum and fiberglass and carbon fiber. I don't want them. Because this is hard to explain for people who don't do kudo, but when, you, when, the, when you're using a traditionally made, well-made uh, equipment and you're using a, a proper hemp string, mm -hmm. When you release the arrow properly, the sound that the string makes when it hits the top of the bow mm -hmm. is just a wonderful, beautiful musical sound. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't get that aesthetic when you use um, artificial bows and arrows. And like the other thing is, is that that the quality of the sound the string makes when it does that can tell an experienced teacher the quality of the shot. Sure. Because if you release precisely, naturally, at the moment of, of the greatest extension, mm -hmm. the, the, um, the string sound has what's called in Japanese sae, sae, meaning to be clear. Mm -hmm. And then when it doesn't work, it's called the tsurune ga nigoru. The, the tsurune is muddy, right. right? So, so a good teacher can, by just listening to the sound of the shot, can immediately deduce the technical and spiritual level of the archer. He doesn't even have to see it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes my teacher would just listen and that was a good shot. Yeah, that was right. He wouldn't even have to look at me. And 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 that level of understanding um, has a great appeal to me. Mm -hmm. Right. It's an organic, natural thing. Maybe it's simply because I'm, I'm, I'm not a scientifically minded person that this appeals to me. But you know, who knows? No, I mean, yeah, and it's, just, it's just, you know, you like what you like. I, I can't really explain why I like Kudo. But, but I think part of the reason I like it is that it's, there's an actual, there's a long tradition, even though things have changed, there's a long tradition behind it. There's um, a real method to it. And the whole, the whole um, way everything is set up is to teach the archer to try to make the perfect shot, um, which of course presupposes that there's a perfect way of using the 
bow and arrow. Whereas, like most Western archers, I know it's like you know, well, whatever. Yeah. I and mean, this isn't true of the real professionals, though. As long as you hit the target, doesn't. Well, yeah, but the, the thing, the thing is, I think real serious Western archers understand archery the same way Japanese yeah, Kudo people do, because. In, in, in the school of Kyudo that I practice, which is called the Hekiryu Insai Ha, um, there's a saying uh, called Chu Kang Kyu, hit pierce forever. So y you can hit the target, you know, you know, no matter what you do, you know, you, maybe, maybe the shooting isn't right, but you can, you can get the arrow to the target. But then, can you pierce it? Because in the old days, I mean, this is this is a serious business. You know, the the, the whole point of kudo is to get a strong penetrating shot just doing this, yeah. that will penetrate the armor and kill the guy. So that requires real technique. You it, just hitting the target is no good if the target just, you know, if it just bounces off. Well, so what? You hit it, but it didn't accomplish anything. Right. You have to pierce it. Mm -hmm. So so how do you achieve? consistent striking and piercing where you can shoot a hundred arrows and hit a hundred arrows and pierce a hundred targets. That's <clears throat> training and technique and proper fundamentals and everything like that. It's not haphazard is my point. You have to know the <clears throat> technique and the fundamentals of everything deep down so you can do it every time. And that requires a, a strong union between your physical body and your mental and spiritual capacities. And so the practice of Kudo, every time you release an arrow, it gives you, it shows you whether or not you've been able to do that. Mm -hmm. And that simplicity, it, but it's a profound simplicity, right? There's a difference between something that's Tan Jun mm -hmm. and Kan Tan, right? Yeah. So Kudo is very Tan Jun in a sense. Mm -hmm. There are not that many elements involved. Right. But it's very, very deep, and it's precisely because it's the same thing every single time. Mm -hmm. The variation within every single shot is one of the attractions of it, because no two shots are ever the same. So why not? <laughs> yeah. uh, one last thing <clears throat> is that, um, well, our, our main thing is old schools, and I know that you recently had the chance to go down to Kyushu and uh, See uh, one of the old traditions from the inside, right? right? It was the uh, what is it's it? called? Satsuma Satsuma Hikiryu. Hikiryu. Koshia. Right. Koshia. It was, they called the Koshia Kumiyumi. 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 Right. right. So the, these guys give demonstrations at Kudo events. Yeah, I've seen them. Right. And research. I can't remember when I first saw them, but again, I saw that 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 is so cool. I mean, really, that's all that it is for me. If it's cool, I love it. You know, <laughs> and it, it's it, it's very. I'd say that this is a group that they shoot uh, yeah. uh, in, in armor and right. uh, in were, formation. And right, that. right. They shoot in formation, and I, I just thought it was the, it was just really awesome. So, knowing me, I probably just went and introduced myself to them. Um, and you know, um, Yano Sensei, who's unfortunately passed away now, um, he was very approachable, and we, you know, I went down to visit them once or twice, and they mm -hmm. gave me a demonstration. We were ex extending, exchanging. Nengajo, you know, New Year's cards, and so I finally got to the point where it appears, if I'm lucky, that they'll actually agree to teach me. So I bought some armor. <laughs> oh, you read the book, you have armor. <laughs> so I'm back to the Society for Creative Anachronism. Again, okay, right? so from the next time you'll be in Japan, you'll try to make some time I'll, to I'll, go to Kyushu. I'll, I'll try to, yeah. Because this um, group only practices in Right, I mean, it's a very small group. Um, the thing is, is that what happened was, is that um, I think the last lord, the second to the last lord of the Shimazu clan, um, um, Shimazu Nariyakira, mm -hmm. I think was his name, he ordered his archery master to come up with uh, you know, this battlefield technique. Okay. And as I understand it, it's, it, it, I think some people might quibble as, whether, as to whether it's really Cody or not, because as I understand it, this was based on Napoleonic era f fire and maneuver tactics, where you have musketeers. Uh -huh. And so what, what they do is that you have like 10 guys, uh -huh. and then... Um, they move in waves, right? Right, right. but it's, the whole thing is done in two parts. Mm -hmm. So they call this Yari Waki no Shaho, mm -hmm. the shooting next to the spears, mm -hmm. literally. So the idea is that first they lay down a, a covering barrage mm -hmm. 
theoretically the enemy is like a hundred yards away or something. So, a, so they're raining arrows right down on them, you know, yeah, yeah, trying to create a barrage so their spearmen would move would under, move under, there under that. Then. You're keeping their archers pinned down so your guys can get and then they engage. Yeah. Then the second part of it is to catch the actual koshi akumi, I mean. Mm -hmm. The koshi yata, they have a, 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 a quiver on the hip. Um, and so at this point, they start shooting in alternate ways. Mm -hmm. You know, every other guy shoots, and then while they're reloading, the guys who didn't shoot will shoot. So you've got a constant stream of arrows. Right. And then, so then the so five, five guys right? moves forward and shoot, and then they duck down <coughs> and reload, and then the guys behind them come forward and shoot, and then they come forward and shoot, and boom, 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 boom. Where they're closing the while they're, they're closing, closing with the enemy, and at the, in the very end, they shoot their last arrow and then use the bows like spears. Right. Um, it's interesting, though. Spearmen. It's called a hokosaki. Mm -hmm. In Hekiryu Insight, how the tip of the bow, the tip of the bow is still called the hokosaki, mm -hmm. whereas in modern Q it's called the uraha or the up the the, the uh, back knock. Mm -hmm. Right. So, because it used to, it used to used be a spear. actually have a spear point, right. the bows would have a spear point over the top. Like you would fix a bayonet yeah, on the end of the arrow, right? Exactly, but exactly. Just... So when you finish shooting your arrows, you'd stab the guy. Right. right. So I mean, um, I'm 66 years old now, so and it's pretty physically demanding to wear the armor and like you know go along the ground like that. So I mean, but just the idea of being able to do it, you know, is uh, it strikes my fancy. Do, do you think uh, do you think it's something that uh, all kidoka should try at some point? Uh, well, it would give them a sense of continuity. Uh, yeah, something? I mean it's a, it's a fundamentally different thing from 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 modern kudo. I, it's just it's not the same. Modern kudo is a, is a, a, a certain thing for a certain purpose, um, and in a, in a sense, kudo modern kudo isn't just target shooting. Mm -hmm. That is to say, you're. Ex a, 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 a quality, an experienced, a skillful archer is expected to hit the target. Right. You know, they have this phrase, say sha hit chu, meaning mm -hmm. a true shot. Uh, yes, okay, so yeah. Right? So, if you can't hit the target, clearly something is wrong. But it's not just target shooting in the way most people think of it. You know, it's, it's, it, it, for it to be, have meaning as kudo, it's supposed to be achieved in a certain specific fashion, right. right? And that's the thing about Kudo that's different in a lot of the other martial arts I should mention is that the, the Japanese adopted the Chinese attitude towards archery because the Chinese attitude to archery was, was one of the gentlemanly arts. Right. And so anybody taking a test for being a member of the civil bureaucracy had to know well, so archery. To know so, so he would be judged on his deportment and his conduct mm -hmm. as well as his skill in shooting because it was considered that a person's character is revealed in how he shoots. Right? What you also see in Japan where there was a Wanaryu, which is a school of uh, etiquette and correct yeah. way of behaving, is also a... Uh, right, and so the, the, school, right? the Kudo has always been, you know, even in the old days, um, Kudo has always been based on this fundamental idea that because of the fact that a person's character is revealed in the way he shoots the bow, that is precisely why Kudo can be a method of character building. This is not a new thing mm -hmm. that modern Kudo put in at all. I want to emphasize it that. Was there it's been there from the very beginning. From, from the very beginning. Because the Japanese uh, aristocracy adopted the Chinese idea because Kudo is a gentleman's art. Mm -hmm. And gentlemen are supposed to act in a certain way. So the, the, the practice became, became to be associated with a lot of ritual. Mm -hmm. Which is completely lacking in Western archery. Right. Completely. That's a, a very fundamental difference. Also, a very fundamental difference is that the cultural position of Kudo in Japan is very different. Mm -hmm. Because in Japan, the bow and arrow was always the weapon of the mounted military aristocrat. Right. It was a gentleman's weapon. Mm -hmm. In the West, it was a weapon for the common soldiers, right. for the villains. The, the, the knights fought with swords and right. lances. Right. So, so the, cultural, the cultural significance of, of archery in Japan is fundamentally different from that in the West. And that's one of the things I was interested in. Okay, one last thing because we're <laughs> out of time. Yeah. Uh,
find, you know, some parting words of wisdom. You know, you've been practicing these things for, like I said, almost half a century now. So, I mean, everyone expects someone to say you know, I, I, something I, profound. No, no, I, unfortunately, I, I don't. Uh, <laughs> you don't do profound. <laughs> well, no, no, actually, though, um, you know, the whole, the whole thing about... Uh, well, I mean, I've learned a lot through my practice of martial arts, I, 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 I'd like to say. And I think um, even though my kendo, I think the kendo was really my formative experience. Um, you were also very young. So I was young, but no, but the thing is, the thing about kendo is that, is that you have to learn to be strong. You have to learn to be self-reliant. You have to learn to be dedicated. You have to learn how to... to um, um, work your way through adversity. Um, and I learned that through kendo. And at the time, when I was doing kendo, I actually, I hated every minute of it. Um, I was afraid of these guys. I mean, they were big, strong guys. They could really have hurt me if they wanted to. But they, they gave me just enough to handle. Right. And no more. This is the mark for true teacher, right? Right, but the thing is, it's not the kind of teaching that any American would think as as teaching. Most Americans think they were just a bunch of sadists, right? Um, but it's funny, when I, I was there for a year and a half in my first trip, and then I decided I wanted to go home. And so when I was taking leave of my sensei, he said, you know, Hartman, you never got any good, but you didn't quit. And I respect that. That was, meant a tremendous amount to me. That is a great you know, lesson. A really, really tremendous amount to me. And so just the ability to apply yourself to something without quitting, I think is like one of the most important things a person can learn in life. It's, so so th that's the thing. I, I act, even though it may sound like I poo-poo all this, you know, uh, Ningen Keisei stuff, I, I really don't. Um, um, I really think it is very, very true that the proper uh, diligent practice of martial arts does form you as a person. And, but the main thing is, is that you have, you have to keep at it, you know, you can't give up on it. And so the very fact of keeping at it and not giving up is the whole point, right? I mean, of course, everyone wants to be good, right? Everyone wants to be the most skillful person. Right. And there's nothing wrong with wanting that. I mean, I mean, I want to be much better than I am. I've been doing Kyoto for, all, for, for almost 50 years, and I'm, I should be a lot better than I am. One of my teachers, Okazaki Sensei, he got Hachi done when he was 45. That's unheard of. That's yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, that's ridiculous. You know, he'd been doing Kyoto for what? Maybe 20 years at the yeah, time? And I'm, I've been doing Kyoto for almost 50. And I'm twice only, the time. And, I, and I'm, I'm only a Renshi Rokuda. So, so what my, yeah. my, my point is, is that, well, well, why don't I give up if I'm not as good as I think I should be? Well, you know. Giving up really isn't an option. I mean, it, it really isn't. I mean, I w I'm going to continue. And so, from that perspective, I think Budo and the practice of Budo has a lot to teach a person, but it's not what people think it is. It's not necessarily just a set of skills. I mean, the, the skills come with it. But what you really learn from Budo is not the skills, it's perseverance. And perseverance, just perseverance, is probably the most important quality a person needs to have to succeed in anything. Yeah, not just Buddha. Yeah, I mean, you know, in not, life, in, yeah. anything at all. And so when they say that Buddha is like a microcosm of life, you know, they say in Kyoto that shooting is life and life is shooting. Mm -hmm. That's what that means, mm -hmm. is that you should apply the lessons you learn in this diligent practice of Buddha to the rest of your life. And so, but I would say the main thing I've learned from <coughs> Kyoto is just how ordinary a person I am. You know, you want to think, you know, especially when you're young, you're special, I'm, I'm going to be special, that, yeah. I'm going to be great, you know, if I just keep practicing, I'm going to be the best there is. And then, but if everybody's doing that, and that, it just doesn't work. So you're, yeah, right? you're not special. And exactly, exactly. I'm nothing special. And I have to learn to accept that, or just work harder to be more special. <laughs> but what, what I'm saying is, that's what the practice teaches you. Because the way you practice anything is, shows you who you are. So it's not the thing, it's how you, how you do, do it. The thing. And that's the main difference, right? 
The thing is, that can apply to anything at all. Yeah, it doesn't have to yeah, be Buddha. Yeah, you know, yeah. piano playing, tennis, all, yeah. all, 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 all your job. I mean, every, every, everything. everything at all. But that's the secret of Buddha, right? The way you approach it is, is how it teaches you about yourself. So if that's, that's the best I can do. <laughs> well, it's, and it's, I, it's, I, I, it's learned, I, learned, I learned a few dead yeah. <laughs> techniques, but but that, but that's really not uh, mm -hmm. th that's not what that's not what. No, no, no. I, I think that this much more important. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, well, with these words of wisdom, we came to the end of the third episode of Buddha no Kuni. Erl, thank you very much for being here with us today. And of course, I would like to thank all of you for watching Buddha no Kuni, the land of martial arts. Uh, be sure to check below for links to El Hartman's dojo and translations, and also for links to Baby's videos, Hidden Magazine, and the BuddhaJapan.com website. If you liked what you saw, you know, tell the world. If you didn't tell us, the contact information is also below, and we'll try to do better next time. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much.